Um, our speaker today is someone who needs no introduction. He has presented to us here in the past, and I found his presentation very enjoyable. I was excited to hear that he likes Japanese neurology. This is something that I'm interested to learn more about, and I'm very pleased to have him present to us today his recent trip to Japan and the three neurology sites that he visited while there. Everyone, please welcome Bob Bushman. <laughs> okay, I'm firing it up here. I hope everybody can hear me and that uh, you can already start to see my picture. So uh, I guess you'll let me know if uh, if if, uh, if you're not uh, keying in here, but otherwise I'll just charge ahead. Are we good to go? Yeah. Okay, great. And uh, of course, I'm uh, gr grateful to Sherry Kitts to uh, already uh, uh, not, not only uh, uh, acknowledge me up on the screen, which I can't see, so I hope I look okay, uh, but also to uh, let you know that I'll be doing a keynote at the Chattanooga National, and that should be fun for everybody too. I haven't spoken about uh, 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 car clocks, old car clocks, since I organized that symposium at the Henry Ford Museum back in 2018. So this will be a nice uh, way for me to get back into that subject that I like, uh, that I enjoy so much and and ran a symposium about. Uh, I'm happy to be sitting here in my warm house. It's 30 degrees outside here in Andover, Massachusetts, but uh, I, I like the cold weather and that's why, uh, that's one reason I live here in my hometown. So uh, uh, it's funny, I was uh, just at a, a chapter eight board meeting, uh, a chapter eight meeting yesterday uh, where they also had to fill in some board members. And usually what happens is if you're not there, uh, you get elected. But uh, I think they only elected one guy who wasn't in the uh, at the meeting that day. So and I think he he already expected to be elected. And um, this chapter, uh, this uh, presentation I gave uh, two weeks ago at a chapter eight meeting. Uh, sorry. Uh, a Connecticut chapter meeting. They were also interested in hearing about uh, uh, Japanese clocks. But one another reason that I went there is also to promote uh, the new uh, New England regional that we're putting on at the end of April up here in Concord, New Hampshire. So uh, I don't know how many of you uh, want to travel up to New England in late April, but I hope you will, uh, uh, because uh, it's something that kind of germinated as I was on a committee with Sherry, and it seemed like uh, something we should try to do. Uh, after all, New England is kind of the birthplace of of uh, North American horology, so uh, it makes sense for us to try to pull all the New England chapters together. And uh, everybody, every single one of the New England chapters agreed to participate in this. We've already got more than 100 mark tables reserved. Great program that I've organized at the New Hampshire Historical Society. So I hope that at least some of you will want to join us up here uh, in Concord, New Hampshire, uh, tax-free Concord, New Hampshire, uh, at the very end of April. We've also married it to a Schmidt Horan auction. So you can, uh, you know, whatever you don't find to buy in the Mart, you can zip right over to their uh, uh, lovely location in Candy in New Hampshire, not far from there. And uh, for their cash and carry auction that afternoon, and then for their regular uh, uh, superb cataloged auction, that'll be the next day. So we're trying to make it a whole clock and watch weekend for anybody who does come. But uh, just to get now to the subject that uh, I'm here to talk about, uh, uh, this is uh, the the map of uh, the, the map of uh, Japan, and there's Tokyo right there, which is where I'll focus on. But my wife and I were there also in order to do a, a lovely hiking trip down here in the Izu uh, Peninsula, the archipelago that's just down there from uh, from Tokyo. So it was uh, uh, I, I was able to uh, uh, enjoy some horological sites that you'll talk about, uh, and my wife very willingly uh, went along with that. But part of the deal was that we have a lovely hiking trip uh, through the that beautiful part of uh, the Izu Peninsula that sticks out into the Pacific Ocean there. So that was uh, uh, part of our trip. And of course, no uh, conversation about about Japan can take place without mentioning Mount Fuji. And uh, you really can't appreciate the, the size and magnitude of that uh, volcanic mountain until you see it. 
And, uh, you know, obviously we were many miles away from it, but it just uh, is this incredible imposing sight. And you understand why there's so much uh, spiritual feeling about this mountain, too, because it's just beautiful uh, uh, sitting there. And uh, uh, you just get a special feeling from seeing it, even if you're just uh, rolling along the highway on your way to somewhere else uh, in Japan. So uh, I was back. I, this is uh, our second trip to Japan. We were there in 2015. Uh, taking a similar hiking trip, but we, of course, were able to see some uh, horological sites as well, including outside of Kyoto, there's the uh, shrine to Emperor, Emperor Tenji, and uh, he was, uh, he's the kind of patron saint uh, emperor of horology, of clock making, in addition to other things, and it's because he brought uh, uh, kind of uh, horology to Japan in the 600s, uh, he brought the first water clock there, so uh, that's why he's important. But um, at the Ten Tenji Shrine, they have an annual day of the blessing of the clocks. And I wasn't there for that, but I found some pictures of it. So they actually, as part of this uh, shrine that's uh, where the emperor is associated with horology, they do the blessing of the clocks. A uh, more frightening thing that I heard of and that I'll mention a little later too is that when uh, uh, when clocks stop working, they feel like that there's a spirit in there and they actually cremate, they burn the clock. So uh, that was a scary thing for some uh, Japanese clock collectors earlier on in our history and they tried to rescue clocks uh, before they were <laughs> before they were burnt up and no longer available for us to enjoy. But on the same grounds as the Tenji, uh, Emperor Tenji Shrine is the only remaining school of watch and clock repair in Japan. And I was able to visit that and meet with the director and he gave us a tour. And there's a view of one of the classrooms uh, where, uh, where young people uh, still can learn about repairing uh, old and new uh, clocks and watches in Japan. So that was a, a nice trip. And I did do a uh, article about that for the bulletin some years ago, which you can uh, search out and check out. There are a few, uh, relatively few number of English language books about Japanese clocks. So if this uh, subject really, uh, really bites you hard, you should uh, seek these books. Some of them are a little hard to find, but you can learn more than I'll be able to tell you today about Japanese clocks. This is kind of one of the classics by Modi. Uh, this is another clock. So Ernest Edwards uh, was a prolific uh, horology scholar and author. And this is a book that he did about Dutch clocks, but uh, because there were such uh, combination uh, um, communications early on between the Dutch and Japanese, uh, there's a good section of this book about Japanese horology. And here's another uh, uh, book much more recently about um, uh, again, uh, astronomical clocks uh, in Tokugawa, Japan. That's the uh, uh, kind of the word for the shogunate period before uh, the, uh, uh, the the shoguns were uh, overthrown in the late 1800s, and they reverted to the the emperor system, where the emperor had some significant power, uh, but again under a more of a parliamentary uh, democratic system. Uh, John Reed was a major collector uh, of Japanese clocks. His collection was sold at Bonhams, as you see back in 2010. Uh, but he was based in uh, in Japan. You see a picture of him here. And here you see that reference I mentioned that I've underlined that you see that they would, on this time day, uh, they would burn up their clocks. So that, uh, that, that alarmed him to the point where he uh, began a significant collection of Japanese clocks, and you see him here uh, working on one of them uh, uh, that he was collecting. Uh, Drummond Robertson also um, uh, had a uh, big uh, uh, portion of his classic book with a special section you see here on the clocks of Japan. And the interesting thing is that Drummond Robertson's collection of Japanese clocks went to the British Museum. And uh, another trip that I made last year, uh, we did a lot of traveling, was to London in order for me to participate in some events there. And uh, one of the stops was at the British Museum where I have, uh, uh, where I returned to the horological study room. Some of you may know about this or be there, but uh, if there are clocks not on display in the museum, and that's the majority of their collection, 
you can request to see them uh, downstairs in the horological study room. And I went down there because I had heard that there were a lot of Japanese clocks that were out in the study room being uh, being a, a better cataloged. The uh, curator there at the uh, British Museum, horological curator, and the guy who runs the uh, horological study room is my friend Oliver Cook. You see Ollie Cook here. He's um, introducing uh, last year's uh, Dilo Bingwall, Dingwall Bilo uh, lecture, which is an annual horology related lecture that's at the British Museum, a very prestigious uh, uh, lecture to, a, uh, to an important large audience. Uh, I'm going to be honored to uh, next year give that uh, give that lecture in London at the British Museum in 2025. So if any of you want to get over to London at the, in the fall of 25, you can see me on the podium there uh, being introduced by my friend Oliver Cook. But the um, uh, fortunately, as I mentioned, there were a lot of Japanese clocks from the Drummond Robertson collection uh, looked at there again because they're uh, examining them more closely and trying to catalog them more accurately. So you see some of the Japanese clocks uh, there and you're starting to get a sense of what these look like. And I'll talk about that more specifically. But there was plenty of uh, eye candy for me to see uh, during that visit to the British Museum as well. There's some close-ups with their inventory tags. Uh, uh, waiting for them to be uh, waiting for them to be uh, looked at more closely. There's a close up again of one of them, and we'll talk about not only the one handed design we're seeing here principally, but the sliding indicators because of the uh, uh, the seasonal, the temporal uh, way that the Japanese told time until 1873 when they switched to Western timekeeping. So this is. Uh, uh, this is a, an example, again, that you'll see more of these, uh, these lantern clocks, but they were often on these trapezoidal uh, pedestals with Japanese writing on them. So uh, and, you know, this is a, a familiar style that you'll see more of. And this uh, pedestal, it enclosed, enclosed the descending weights because virtually all the Japanese clocks uh, were weight driven because uh, uh, they preceded the time when spring technology really was available for most timekeeping. You may remember that uh, one of my passions that I, again, organized a symposium about here in Boston at the Museum of Fine Arts in 2017 is horology and art. I wrote, uh, I've written 40 articles about it, most of them uh, in our bulletin. And I always look for uh, all kinds of artworks that have uh, clocks and watches in them. And one of my uh, favorites, of course, are these old uh, uh, woodblock uh, Japanese prints. And if I'm lucky, I find ones that have examples of these Japanese clocks on them. And in this case, you see one of those up here in the corner. Um, one of the fun things I did while I was at the horological uh, study room at the British Museum was went through a stack of about 300 of their early horological prints. Uh, this is not Japan related, but just to remind me to tell you that not only do they have a lot of clocks there, but they have a lovely collection, uh, uh, and most of them not on display, just in these uh, folders and envelopes of very early uh, uh, horological prints, and this is simply one example that's uh, from uh, long ago and showing uh, uh, clocks of that period in ways that uh, we can't always see them uh, see them otherwise. Uh, this is another Japanese print, and in this case, you see that they've illustrated a globe with clockwork, and that kind of excited me to see that. I wasn't aware of that uh, before that that there were Japanese versions of these clockwork-driven globes. And uh, uh, it reminded me uh, another place that I was in Europe last year was in France and at their uh, Art and Métier Museum. That's a decorative arts and some kind of science and technology a craft museum, very famous, full of beautiful stuff. This is a European version of those clockwork driven globes. So you can see uh, uh, what that looks like and uh, just one of the kinds of treasures that you can see there in Paris as well. Of course, uh, Japanese clocks occasionally come up at, at auction. You see uh, one uh, being sold from a collection here at the Skinner Auction House, now Bonham Skinner, uh, that's near me here in Massachusetts. This is one of their clock guys, uh, Paul Dumanowski, who's demonstrating, uh, this, again, the sliding indicator for the seasonal hours. There's uh, one of the pages of their catalog again showing that clock and showing uh, other types of clocks that they uh, that they offered at that auction as well. But just to talk about uh, how they told time back then, 
again, they were uh, dealing with seasonal timekeeping because they were setting their clocks as everybody used to uh, with sundials. And as you know, uh, uh, the hours get longer and shorter seasonally with the winter hours uh, at night are short and long uh, at night are long and short during the day and vice versa in the summer. Uh, and each of their hours were named after animals, as you see here. There are the symbols, and they didn't like the numbers one, two, and three. So there's no one, two, and three o'clock back then in uh, in Japan. The numbers started there at four and and worked up in this in this sequence. So uh, I suppose, uh, luckily for us now, if we're in Japan, they they use Western timekeeping because this would be kind of confusing for us to know what time it was, especially as the hours got longer and shorter seasonally. Uh, but all that changed when uh, Commodore Perry showed up there in the 1850s in his black ships and uh, opened Japan. They had been closed for uh, uh, more than uh, 300 years to foreigners. There were only uh, uh, one or two ports where uh, certain uh, countries were allowed to do some trading but never enter the country. And that's why kind of the Japanese system of timekeeping and their horological uh, manufacturing uh, craftsmanship was sort of stuck in the uh, 1500 technology of virgin folio, no mainsprings, uh, but married to this uh, Japanese system. So this is just a uh, an illustration, a Japanese illustration. They were very interested, of course, the populace and who these uh, foreigners, these long noses uh, kind of invading uh, peacefully and convincing the Japanese uh, government that they should allow uh, uh, American and European uh, trade and visitors. So this is a uh, depiction of them describing uh, Perry's uh, Perry's arrival. Uh, one of the Japanese prints that I own that has clocks and watches in it is this one. It's a Yokohama print from shortly after Commodore Perry arrived. And the Japanese population was very interested in what um, Westerners, uh, Americans looked like. So this is a depiction of a of a party at which uh, European sailors and uh, uh, women and children were present and uh, a Western style clock on the wall there that you see as well. Uh, I would say that some of these uh, uh, Americans still look uh, slightly uh, Asiatic. So uh, they, they weren't quite sure how to depict this, but they uh, they did the best that they could at the time. So. Uh, during our stay in Tokyo, uh, you can see, of course, to Tokyo is an incredibly modern uh, city with big buildings, extremely clean. You could walk for days and not see a piece of litter. Uh, but below there, that brick building is the Tokyo Station Hotel. It used to be the train station, and in fact, behind it and under it is a immense train station serving uh, uh, a lot of Japan. You can uh, almost live down there below with miles of uh, tunnels and tracks and everything. Uh, we needed an escort to find our way from our train from the airport into the hotel building, but we made it. And this is one of the few buildings, uh, you know, remaining from that time in Japan. And you'll hear why most of them don't exist anymore. But it was a, a lovely hotel centrally located. And what we try to do when we travel to places where we would uh, waste a lot of time trying to find things on our own, is we uh, recruit uh, local guides. So this is our uh, our guide for a couple of days there in Tokyo, especially if we wanted to find horological sites uh, that were uh, perhaps uh, difficult to find. So this is Ryo Tamaki. It turns out his father had a um, modern mantle clock with the Hermley movement in it that, is fa that had failed. So I was able to uh, arrange for him to be sent a uh, a replacement Hermley movement, and, and now his dad is uh, is happy that his it is Western style clock is running in Japan. Uh, in, now, uh, thanks to me helping getting him one of those replacement movements. And, uh, you know, of course, uh, there are still sort of more traditional street scenes here. This is a market street, but you see up above here, there's a modern Seiko clock, which is letting people know what time it was as they work their way through the through the market area. And this is uh, this amused me. This was a uh, a sushi clock that isn't real sushi, but what we saw uh, this was one thing we saw in this very famous street where all the shops sell artificial food because the uh, Japanese restaurants like to display in their front windows the kinds of food that you'll be able to order if you go inside. So there's all this uh, very skillfully, realistically created artificial food. But yeah, I could have bought this uh, this clock, which has sushi for the 
for the time indicators, uh, uh, I resisted that Japanese yen price converts, I think, to about $80. And I didn't think I, I needed a fake sushi clock for $80. But uh, if you go to Japan and want one of these, I can tell you where to find it. So our first stop uh, was the one that was the most difficult to find because it's the Daimyo uh, uh, Clock Museum. Uh, it's kind of uh, not in one of the uh, uh, main areas of Tokyo, more of a residential area. It's in a large house that was uh, uh, owned by a major collector of Japanese clocks. So uh, kind of we were very lucky to have our guide uh, uh, help us find this uh, find this museum. Daimyo is a name for uh, you know early kind of lords and warlords of Japan and the founder of this museum, the collector claimed uh, ancestry, daimyo ancestry. So that's the name of this. So there's another entrance and you see some of the uh, traditional Japanese building there in the back, which houses not only some of the family members, but, uh, but his museum as well. And there's a picture of the uh, collector. He died many years ago, but now his uh, daughter-in-law and grandson were the ones who were minding the shop when we visited and we uh, were able to see them. Uh, but there's his picture. And he also was very concerned and he founded this collection because he thought that not only were these clocks being burnt up if they didn't work, but they weren't appreciated. And he saw that a lot of traditional Japanese clocks, valuable, important, rare ones, were going overseas to collectors like John Reed. And he thought, you know, that Japanese collectors should be uh, uh, preserving and saving these as well. So this is his collection. Uh, you know, the, the family doesn't seem quite that motivated and interested. So I'm wondering what ultimately will happen to this collection. But uh, it was certainly there for us to see then. And as you see, all the signage was in Japanese. So uh, we just had to do some looking. So uh, there I am with uh, with my wife as we were uh, getting settled in the museum again with one of those clocks there to my right, uh, to our right. And you see that the weights are hanging inside once that front panel of this lantern clock is revealed. Uh, uh, you also notice those blue slippers. If you've ever been to Japan or know that, uh, you know, they'll have uh, apoplexy. If you walk into a house with your street shoes on, you immediately, before you go in there, you remove them and you put on slippers that are always provided at these places. So uh, I uh, uh, most of the time I remembered and didn't uh, cause anybody a lot of distress by stomping right in my street shoes. But that's why I'm wearing those uh, uh, those nice blue slippers that were provided. So, the, of course, there were some uh, lovely Japanese horological prints in that museum as well. So you're able to see, again, this, uh, again, this typical kind of uh, clock there behind this uh, Japanese figure. So there's a close-up of this. And what this allows us to see not only is the early technology, you know, these iron, mostly iron, uh, sometimes brass, but mostly iron gears, again, uh, very early. But the, in this case, you see the double folio system, too because uh, some of the clocks would have the sliding indicators to create larger and bigger or smaller gaps between the hours seasonally, but others uh, actually had double folios so that uh, at dawn or at, um, uh, you know, at, uh, at the evening time, the clock would automatically switch to folio, a second folio that would run faster or slower, dependent on the season. So you still can see these uh, weights that could be placed in and out to adjust the timekeeping rate, but you see that there's a top folio and a bottom folio, and one would engage uh, the, while the other disengaged to make the clock run faster or slower seasonally. And these typically were adjusted every couple of weeks as they tried to keep up with seasonal, uh, seasonal changes. And even earlier technology were incense clocks, where you could have a string of incense here or some other way of burning incense in a way that as it burnt down, you could see the passage of time. You could mark the passage of time by the uh, the string or the band of incense that was burning along in the system. So you'll see, um, again, just some of the displays here too there. And some of you may be familiar with these Japanese bracket clocks. It kind of looked like our bracket clocks, but uh, you know have uh, that same kind of uh, timekeeping technology in them as well as later ones ones, once they had Western timekeeping, uh, they made a lot of clocks uh, uh, that looked like uh, Connecticut clocks and uh, were produced in their factories. But there's some of their uh, uh, depictions. And you see here, this chart is, uh, well, there's my uh, Edward Duffield clock striking. I'll mention him again in a minute and uh, towards the end. 
but they were certainly aware, of course, of the uh, of the need to make the hours uh, to show faster and slower. So here's one of their depictions of the equation of time of the uh, shortening and lengthening hours as the as each day progressed. So uh, you know they were. This is their depiction of how uh, how that got evolved. So there's another one of these Japanese prints that shows the same kind of lantern clock, but on this um, uh, other kind of stand, an open stand where the weights are visible below it on kind of cabriole legs. Uh, that was also interesting. We see some bigger versions of that as well. And another one of these uh, equation of time uh, charts that there to, to try to explain how all of this worked. They certainly had some uh, Western clocks on display, including you see, uh, you know, Seth Thomas uh, naval clock there as well as as well as uh, a Hamilton 21 chronometer. So they were uh, in an English dial clock here with the fusee movement. So, uh, you know, they wanted to tell as much as they could of uh, uh, the a more complete story of hor horological history. So they had some of those on display, including this uh, Le Culture Atmos clock too, that I'm sure a lot of you recognize as well. And they even had an English long case clock there from Nottingham uh, as part of the story too. So the second um, venue was not as hard to find. It's one of their major museums of science and history, and they have a wonderful gallery of horology. They also have a guidebook that's uh, uh, that's available. However, it's only in Japanese, but I picked this up in the bookstore afterwards, and I was... Uh, 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 our guide was in there too, and I was looking at the books and trying to see what was important. And our guide asked this older volunteer there, uh, who was helping uh, the shoppers, saying, "You know, what would be a book that would show uh, some of the watches and clocks we saw in the museum?" And he uh, pointed out this one, and he sold it to me. And then the uh, they had a little chat between them, and the our guide told us that this old gent was formerly the uh, director of the entire museum. He was the top guy at the museum and now in retirement, he just helps out in the gift shop. So I got to meet somebody uh, kind of important without realizing it. So here was uh, the kind of the outside sign uh, outside of the horological gallery. So you see the way it was laid up and here they're uh, showing you where you go here to measure time to, if you want to get to the gallery in this big museum that has it. So, you know, as you can imagine, this was a more professional, bigger museum with uh, you know, the things really packed into those cases and good signage and indication. Again, all the signage was in Japanese, but there was a way to find out what it said. And you see here, too, some of these Japanese pillar clocks. Uh, I, uh, I used to own one of these, in fact. Uh, and these uh, were designed in this way, not only to kind of look like a type of boxed incense clock, which is probably the derivation of the style, but also so it could hang on the wall on the posts of Japanese clocks, because especially the interior walls of Japanese homes were not solid walls like ours. So you couldn't just bang a nail into the wall and hang the clock up wherever you wanted. There were these uh, cedar posts, perhaps four inch square, six inch square, uh, holding the, the, the house together. But separating those posts were rice paper walls, sometimes sliding panels. So you needed a long skinny clock like that if you're going to hang it on the wall. Wall, and the only place you could hang it was on one of those posts. So we see that. So here again, you see one of these uh, display cases bursting with Japanese uh, clocks and watches. I should remember before I forget, I'm hoping to put together a small group tour where we go back to these places in Japan. Uh, can't be that big, but if some of you are super interested and actually want to visit Japan with a targeted focus on their horology, uh, you should get in touch with me. Maybe a year from now, I'll be able to have put this together and have a tour where you can see these things in person, not just uh, on, on the screen with me telling you. But the way that they were able to help Westerners, uh, English speaking people know what was in the cases is they had these touch screens uh, right there. So you could select English and then up would come these screens and you could compare it to what you're seeing in the cases and you would get the uh, English language description of what you were seeing, including those these little in-row watches that were little cases that could that would hang on your sash or your belt in the old days. And maybe you would have your pills in there or some papers or coins, but some of them also had built in clocks and 
wa uh, little watches or clocks, small clocks built into the in-row cases. So those were fun to see. There's another one of these bursting, uh, bursting cases with a variety of Japanese timekeeping on display. We see more of them here as well. So, uh, you know, I, I could have spent all day there and uh, I hope to get back there and spend longer, uh, even that too. And as you see, they even uh, provided some indication of how these things work. And this is even a clearer uh, view of those that double, double folio system, the double uh, uh, escape wheel system down here. And if you look at this closely, you can see how, you know, there would be these pawls that could lift and drop and would engage uh, one of the folios and disengage the other as the 24-hour uh, period advanced. And that version of a kind of a count wheel that would uh, actuate and disengage uh, those two folio systems. They also had orreries. I didn't know about this before, but they would show planetary movements. Uh, you know, we're more familiar with Western versions of orreries. Uh, this is one that was made by Aaron Willard. So uh, that's a nice thing to know that he was not only uh, somebody put his names on lovely mm -hmm. New England and clocks, but uh, did this uh, planetarium orrery as well that uh, when it was cranked, this wasn't clockwork um, uh, driven automatically, but if you turn the crank, uh, this uh, uh, replica of the solar system would function and teach us about how things were moving. And some of you may know, you know, there certainly were other uh, clockwork driven orrery clocks, including these famous ones by Rango uh, that we sometimes see at auctions itself for uh, tens of thousands of dollars. Uh, but they're uh, beautiful examples, again, of uh, being able to see how there, our solar system works in an automatic way driven driven by clockwork. So, of course, after uh, Western timekeeping came along and in Japan tried to uh, successfully uh, 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 industrialize quickly, uh, one of the things they did was that they uh, established clock uh, uh, factories based on Connecticut systems and, uh, and Connecticut styles. Uh, some of you who do clock repair or collector may have seen these clocks. And uh, maybe if not knowing they were Japanese, you thought they were early American uh, Connecticut clocks. And that, that that mistake was uh, even compounded because there were uh, uh, thousands of these that were imported, often sent by GIs after World War II during the occupation or later where these were gathered up in big numbers sent back here. And then they were sold as American antiques. I have ads from a company called the Pony Express Company that had images of these order a genuine uh, American early antique and you'd get one of these Japanese clocks and they've shown up in my repair uh, shop uh, and I have to break the bad news to these people that they actually have a Japanese clock, uh, not a Connecticut clock. And, uh, and the, you know, these aren't the greatest clocks in the world and often they're difficult to make work after they've been run, uh, run into the ground by people who just ran them until they quit without uh, service them. Uh, but this is a more uh, traditional style of Japanese clock, even though it's later single hand. But again, this really shows you how they could move uh, these hour indicators uh, seasonally to create bigger and smaller gaps between between the hours. So there's a few more examples. Once Western timekeeping came along of all the huge numbers of clocks and watches that they generated in Japan, not only for the uh, their domestic market, but for export as well. But of course, they had to have sundials too. And this is a lovely uh, example and a beautiful carved hand of uh, an early Japanese sundial, which we, they would be using to set their clocks and watches. So our third uh, and final stop in Tokyo was the Seiko Museum. Certainly everybody here knows the Seiko name. Uh, they've been around for uh, uh, far more than 100 years, and they have an English uh, language version, which is a catalog of, of their collection. They own more than 10,000 clocks and watches there. And they both, uh, within the last decade, built a beautiful new five-story museum in the Ginza section of Tokyo, which is the high-end kind of Rodeo Drive, if you know about that, or Fifth Avenue. You know, it's where all the expensive designer shops are, and they have a beautiful location there. They previously were in another building, uh, but this is a you know, state-of-the-art, beautiful uh, a museum, and this is the entrance uh, to the museum. There's a large-scale uh, welcoming from a descendant, a direct descendant of the founder, Shinji Hattori, uh, is welcoming everybody to the uh, this new Seiko Museum, uh, talking about, again, the founder 160 years ago of this, uh, of this group. And he uh, 
originally uh, was a repairer, then he wanted to manufacture uh, Japanese uh, timekeeper keepers and as you see the museum has over 10,000 of them so here again are Jean and I are being welcomed by a guest you know the, they're the epitome of hosp hospitality and courtesy there so we had a little uh, tea and refreshments uh, beforehand uh, and then uh, this is uh, one of the main guys there at the uh, Seiko Museum who then uh, showed us around very uh, very nicely took uh, time and then we spent more time on our own after uh, after we didn't need him uh, pointing out things. And there's his business card. That's his name, Noboru, uh, from uh, from the Seiko Group. Uh, and you see this is their uh, new motto here, moving ahead, touching hearts. And uh, one thing you learn when someone, it's kind of a ritual, you're presented with their business card, you're supposed to take it with two hands, not one. And if you exchange uh, and give them your business card, again, you present it uh, with two hands and you don't just, you know, immediately stuff it in your pocket. You're supposed to, uh, to uh, look at it, read it, carefully and show that you appreciate uh, receiving the business card. So there's, uh, well, you'll just see some views of these beautiful modern galleries, not only things on display, and you see most of these clocks look like Western clocks. And, you know, that's what they were producing and imitating in order to get started and then to continue uh, selling export uh, and domestic things. And many of these display cases, as you see here, have pull out drawers below them with even more things to look at in there. So you had to make sure that you opened these drawers up too and saw more great things on display there. So there's another uh, one of the galleries. You see, uh, uh, you know, the founder back there with one of those um, one of those Western style school clocks. Uh, apparently, this was kind of industrial espionage where he went with his chief engineer, visited uh, Connecticut factories, and some of them said, "Oh, sure, you know, come on in, look around," and they would look around as much as they could, and then they would rush back to their hotel and make all kinds of notes and drawings so that they could replicate a lot of the procedures and machinery uh, that they saw during each day's visit. So here he is as a young man. There's kind of an image of the kind of clock shop he would have worked on back in the 1800s in Japan in one of the early buildings with a clock tower uh, that he was uh, associated with. So they would, in 1892 is when they when Kentaro Hatari, the founder, decided he wanted to start uh, manufacturing both clocks and watches as well. And that's a lot of what this uh, museum demonstrates. You see already back in 1892, Sekosha was the name before uh, they shortened it uh, uh, into Seiko. And you see, again, these uh, you know are quite like uh, uh, Connecticut clocks, uh, which they were uh, replicating, and the watches as well. Even way back in 1897, they started to make pocket watches. They started to make uh, uh, wrist watches, again, which look kind of like Swiss ones or perhaps uh, or the first uh, Waltham, uh, smaller smaller wrist watches. But this is Japan's first wrist watch uh, being manufactured there. And here's later ones. Some of these like this looks like, you know, a French deco clock and even, you know, these digital clocks with the uh, flipping numbers. So, uh, you know, they, uh, they tried to do everything they could to uh, manufacture clocks uh, and watches that were on the Western plan and would sell. So we're seeing kind of a progression. They uh, did a chronological uh, survey of what was being produced uh, by principally by Seiko, but other countries, as, other companies as well in Japan. As we move along, here's one of their trade catalogs from 1916. Uh, it could almost be, you know, a West Clocks or an Ingram uh, catalog, but obviously it's uh, things that were made in Japan and with all their uh, Japanese description. There's a close up of, you know, what looks like one of those French uh, deco clocks that, uh, uh, that I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with as well. And they even produced uh, these Braille watches. You see the label down here, 1939. So a blind person could, without a crystal, they could feel the hand position and they could feel the dots on the dial to know uh, what time it was as well. Here we're getting up into the 50s here and they're showing uh, uh, more modern styles as well, wristwatches and watches along with technological development. You know, certainly Seiko, even then, you know, they weren't uh, backward or primitive at all. They were making state-of-the-art watches as good as anything being made anywhere else. 
Uh, we're up into the 1960s now, and uh, again, more modern looking timepieces uh, of all type. Uh, and as you may know, they were the first to actually commercially produce a quartz wristwatch. So this is the first one, their Astron, back in 1969. It costs as much as a Japanese car back then. Uh, but you know, there were people who, of course, like today, want the newest and best, uh, no matter what it costs. So this was the first, again, the, you know, the earlier the Swiss uh, developed quartz technology, timekeeping technology, but they uh, uh, didn't commercialize it or miniaturize it until, uh, until the Japanese did uh, a few decades later. But uh, there's the first one. So uh, uh, that's a big part of the story. But another part of the Tokyo story is the virtual destruction of the city back in 1923. So here's, I usually don't try to put a lot of text on my screens as I'm talking, but this really succinctly harkens back to that horrible day in September of 1923, the worst disaster in history, millions of people homeless, uh, most of the city destroyed, the, as you see the destruction, four times larger than the uh, than the entire national budget. So it was a, a huge problem. And if, uh, if you don't believe me, here's uh, uh, just one of many photographs showing the extent of the destruction in the city at that time. And of course, just like in San Francisco, it's not the earthquake that uh, causes all the damage, usually they're immediately followed by horrible infernos, horrible fires, just because gas mains have broken and, and candles and lanterns have tipped over. And you, essentially, those, what, what, else, what wasn't ruined by the earthquake is destroyed by fire. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's compounded uh, the, the scope of the disaster. So, Already, uh, uh, Kentaro had a whole uh, uh, workshop, you know, full of many people, both manufacturing and repairing. So he had 1,500 timepieces in his shop at the time of this disaster. And uh, one thing that kind of made his name uh, and his reputation was that he replaced every single one of those for free to whatever customer had watches in his shop at the time of the disaster. So that really uh, uh, was something that they're still proud of. And, uh, and it again, kind of made his uh, reputation here too. But if you're wondering what happened to the watches that were in that fire, uh, they have this, what looks like a sculpture almost, but this was dug out of the ruins later. And this is uh, just showing you the intensity, the heat of the fire that fused this, uh, this group of pocket watches awaiting repair into this blackened uh, sculptural <laughs> uh, piece uh, uh, that shows what happened to those watches. So uh, uh, I think uh, this is, uh, if, if anything could tell you the story uh, as uh, explicitly as this, uh, you'd have trouble finding something that would be a stronger image uh, than that. So here are, of course, watches made after that. Uh, they rebuilt. Fortunately, about half of their machinery uh, was not totally destroyed. They were able to repair and rehabilitate it. So they had kind of a jump start on rebuilding and uh, and modernizing at the same time. So here's kind of display. Uh, you see these are all timers, uh, stopwatches, and you see the kinds of sports that they say uh, they would be applied to. Uh, here's uh, again another case, a very modern looking, uh, uh, almost toy clocks in some cases, uh, uh, cuckoo clocks as well, mm -hmm. modern clocks we're seeing. But they, even more than that, Daimyo Museum made a big effort too to show the comprehensive history of timekeeping with uh, many lovely uh, European examples as well. So here you see uh, uh, so, some uh, uh, the Dutch clock, uh, English style, uh, much earlier, uh, single-handed European wall clocks. So they tried to tell the uh, uh, the broader story as well. You know, uh, swingers, uh, French uh, uh, oscillating pendulum clocks, English bracket clocks, French. Uh, bull case clocks, uh, you know, they, they clearly were on a mission to tell the whole story and, and obtain wonderful, uh, beautiful examples of European uh, clock making as well. Uh, and going even farther back to sundials and clepsydra, this is an early, you know, Egyptian uh, water clock where the water would uh, uh, go slowly through a hole in the bottom and you could tell the time by rings inside. Uh, candle clocks here, you see an illustration of that, uh, incense clocks, and 
you know this uh, this example of an early you know iron frame uh, uh, European clock too from that uh, uh, same old period. But they had something even more important, and this is the sign first. So in 1854. Uh, uh, according to this, and uh, I'll talk a little bit more about this, there was a prototype built for uh, the movement in the, in the Parliament Tower, the, the Big Ben Tower there in London, and, uh, and they have this movement. They don't, um, uh, they don't have uh, much provenance information except for uh, the antique shop in Tokyo that they bought it from in the 1970s, uh, but as you see, it says Denison on here, and uh, I've now shared this with uh, people who know a lot more about the Westminster clock than I do, and they, uh, uh, they're they uh, incredibly impressed by this, and they want to go see it. Probably the most, the guy who knows the most is Keith Scobie Youngs. He was our speaker uh, at the uh, Lancaster um, convention last year. Uh, here he is giving uh, last year's uh, Dingwall Below lecture, uh, and he was talking about his six year restoration of the uh, of the entire movement uh, and clock in the uh, in the tower of Big Ben. So it's uh, he's, he's the guy that uh, hands on worked on it for six years, restoring every part of it up at, up in his shop. He took it back to his shop up in northern England in the Lake District. Uh, but this is him beginning his lecture uh, about that. And this is a picture of him as he's working on that movement that's up there in the tower. So uh, he's become a good friend of mine. Uh, we've seen each other a number of times. He's invited me up to his shop there in uh, Cumbria, which I hope to do sometime uh, very soon. A great guy uh, and obviously one of the most skilled horologists in the world. His main business is repairing uh, old tower clocks all across England. And uh, that's how he's made it. But as uh, when I emailed him about this and sent him a picture, his reply saying, if this is actually legit and original, it's the early, earliest example of a double three-legged escapement that's known. So uh, uh, he's uh, claiming that it's uh, probably the workmanship of William Potts. So, you know, once in a while when you're uh, on these adventures and you're looking at clocks and suddenly you stumble upon something you weren't expecting and that maybe shouldn't even be there, it's uh, it's uh, adds to the thrill of what you're seeing along the line. So, of course, they had a lovely collection, too, of these early Japanese uh, style clocks as well. You're starting, I'm sure, to get familiar to these styles where we have the lanterns with the double folios quite often, uh, these trapezoidal bases uh, and all that. So, you know, this is, uh, you know, much more kind of professionally and spread out uh, um, exposition of these as compared to the uh, uh, to that crowded museum that we saw previously. Here's another example of an orrery uh, that they have in their collection as well with this cover that would go on it. Uh, but again, showing uh, uh, the passage of time, they have a lovely collection of these European uh, early enameled watches, mostly from Geneva, where these things were uh, were produced beautifully, but also certainly American examples too of uh, of our pocket watch production. And again, some more more of these uh, pillar clocks too, which now you understand why they have this uh, type of shape in order to go in those pillars in those houses. The Japanese did produce marine chronometers. Obviously, uh, uh, once World War II began after Pearl Harbor, they were not able to buy uh, chronometers made in, uh, in England or France or America, uh, and they were able to produce their own in small numbers during the early 1940s. And this is an example of one of those marine chronometers. Obviously, it looks quite quite like uh, European chronometers. I'm sure they were just trying to copy them as best they could so that they could have uh, chronometers in their warships and merchant ships as well. Uh, Another bonus is right there in that reception area that you saw at the beginning. Uh, they have uh, working uh, equipment. These are mostly from the 20s, uh, where they, these uh, machines actually operate. These were production machines, kind of like we're in the Waltham factory. This machine here is the one that actually drilled the threaded holes in the rims of watch balance wheels. So this would simultaneously uh, drill and tap holes in balance wheel rims for for watches so they you know it wasn't some guy sitting there by candlelight this was uh, production machinery which they had perfected and used some of it was of swiss origin some they made themselves uh, or perhaps from uh, Waltham as well, where they could source this type of uh, high sophisticated automatic production uh, watch machinery as well uh, 
I couldn't resist, uh, you know, now wanting a Seiko watch. I wasn't going to spend tens of thousands on a Grand Seiko. But uh, when I went to uh, Chapter 87, that's our local Massachusetts chapter meeting, I had to uh, uh, look around for one. And in fact, uh, that's what I'm wearing here now. And uh, it's an automatic. And uh, the thing with these Seiko automatics is uh, there's no way to wind them except to uh, to wiggle them and rotate them. There's no uh, where you can't pull the pull the stem out and manually wind them. So uh, I guess they figured, why bother? All you had to do was uh, wiggle it a little and it would start up. The crown simply sets the time. But I also thought that uh, this is great. Now I know all those people at Seiko. Uh, I'll send them this picture and they'll tell me exactly when this watch was made and you know how much it cost and everything. So I sent this picture to my friend Noburu there. And after a few days, they wrote back and said, we don't have this watch in our catalog. It's, uh, it's one that must have been made for a specific market at a certain time. And then when I showed it at a, a mass watchmakers meeting, one of the guys there who ran a repair shop for many, many years, Jack Kershenak, who's a, a leader of the AWCI, he said, oh, yeah, I often would have uh, customers come in, uh, Hispanic ones, and they would say, have you got any of those Puerto Rico watches, those Puerto Rico Seikos? And he didn't know what they were talking about at first, but then they showed him and he said, I can identify them by this five on the dial, and this must be one of the watches that Seiko specifically made and marketed in the Caribbean and in Latin America. So uh, I guess I have kind of an interesting Seiko watch uh, without even realizing it when uh, when I bought it. Uh, nobody has to uh, have me tell you what this building is, but I'm showing our National Museum because they also have a lovely uh, collection of Japanese timekeepers. And I saw these when uh, I was there in Lancaster uh, for our uh, convention last summer. So uh, I already knew that, uh, you know, my subject was going to be uh, Japanese timekeeping in a lot of ways. So I took some good pictures of the clocks that they have there. So you don't have to go to Tokyo to see some of these. All you have to do is get to Columbia and you'll see some of these same kinds of clocks with nice uh, um, captions and uh, descriptive material explaining how they work and seeing them uh, working. Not all of their Japanese clocks are uh, on display. And I was interested in seeing what they had in storage because I, uh, as the exhibit curator for the Horological Society of New York, uh, we're planning an exhibit in Manhattan of Japanese timekeeping. We're borrowing some things from the Seiko Museum. Uh, but we will also borrow some things from the NAWCC Museum, which are not on display. We won't be uh, robbing their display cases out front, uh, but we'll be borrowing some of the things that they aren't showing uh, for the display. And this is the second time that um, our museum has coordinated with the uh, Horological Society of New York's uh, little library museum area in Manhattan that we we also showed some James Arthur watches there uh, a year or two ago. So this will be another time when some NAWCC things that aren't on display will be shared elsewhere and people will learn more about the NAWCC and its museum because they'll see some of its objects uh, on display in another place. And there's the uh, there's the uh, entrance door of uh, HSNY, we call it there, uh, in a lovely old uh, historic building in Manhattan. And uh, you see they have a nice tower clock uh, working movement on display, the huge library that they now have, 25,000 books and ephemera, uh, uh, the largest, uh, one of the largest horological uh, libraries uh, in the world, uh, comparable to what we have down in Columbia. And uh, I like this picture too, because this is a clock uh, I donated, because this is a clock from the James Arthur collection that never got to the Smithsonian, never got to uh, uh, our museum in Columbia. It uh, probably went to the family early on and then eventually went through auction, et cetera. And I ended up with it. And then I figured it should be in the uh, back in New York City, which is where James Arthur always wanted his collection to be on display anyway. So at least one of his clocks is uh, in the city that he wanted it to be at uh, uh, more than 100 years ago when he wrote his will and donated his entire collection. So it's uh, I feel good about it. Uh, and not standing in my foyer anymore, but being there in New York City where uh, James Arthur would have liked to see it. Um, I also write not only a lot in the bulletin, as I hope a lot of you uh, know and have seen my name, but I also write for the uh, uh, Antiquarian Horology magazine, which is the quarterly journal of the Antiquarian Horological Society in England, which is kind of the English version of the NAWCC. 
So uh, very soon uh, their uh, next issue will come out. And there's about a six page article of mine that talks uh, again, uh, as you've heard today about the uh, uh, the tour that I made in, in Tokyo at that time. So I hope that uh, this has been uh, uh, interesting and enjoyable for you. I hope that at least uh, some of you uh, someday get to Japan, not only to see a beautiful country, uh, but to also see some uh, beautiful examples of Japanese horology, which, as you see, are in many ways unique, different, interesting, and not what we see uh, uh, mostly here in America and in Europe when we're looking at timekeepers. So again, I hope this was interesting. I'm happy to uh, to answer any questions or just chat a bit. And of course, I'll look forward to seeing you all in uh, in Chattanooga. Who, who all of you who get there in Chattanooga next June, where uh, we'll talk more about this as well. Thanks again for having me. Did anybody have any questions they would like to ask? Yes, and please repeat them because I can't hear the audience very well. What is the distribution of the seasonal feeding up and slowing down? Can you step up, Bob? Up to the mic. So Bob, yeah. Yeah. We'll dig in. A brief description of. How the clock speed up and slow down seasonally. That's what he was asking. A, a brief description of how that would work. Okay. Um, if if you're asking about the actual mechanical function of it, you know it would. Um, Every day, let's assume, uh, let's assume it's the equinox. So we're at uh, June twenty, uh, June twenty first. At that time, the day hours and the night hours are of equal duration. Every uh, so that uh, if you divide it by twelve, you know the hour is the same length of time. If you were timing it on a on a pocket watch, uh, the hour between twelve and one a.m. would be as six would be sixty minutes. Uh, the same as the hour between midnight and 1 a.m. If you're talking about the solstice, uh, December 21st or 22nd, um, if the uh, and you're in the northern hemisphere at the you know the latitude of Japan, the uh, the hour at noon would probably be about 40 minutes, and the hour at midnight would probably be about an hour and a half. So. Uh, if you're trying to know what time it is in Japan 200 years ago in the middle of winter, if you just let the clock run at clock time, it wouldn't be the, 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 the right time for everybody who's setting their clocks and watches by a sundial. So the, the solar time, you know, shows those lengthening and shortened hours. That shadow actually, you know, in the winter uh winter noontime you know goes through that hour in 40 minutes you know so if you're trying to make your clocks show you know sundial time the only way you can do that is to either keep resetting the little sliding hour indicators it's like if you on your own clock if you could take one o'clock and move it move it closer or farther away from 12 that's what you'd have to do to have your clock your clock time correspond to sundial time. So, you know, it seems complicated, but I guess, you know, they they got used to it. And if if they were trying to coordinate, because if people were using both, let's assume that, you know, you were supposed to show up uh, on the city walls, you know, to start your guard duty at noon, and you're telling time from a sundial, but your boss in the castle is telling time from a clock, you know, you would you, be later early, uh, to your assignment so that you know just like in western europe you know they needed if they were coordinating time they needed to all be on the same page so you know this was the way that if they were using mechanical clocks and at the same time using sundials 
they were all telling the same time roughly. And the only way you could get a clock to speed up if you weren't using the sliding indicators was to have it run faster at night uh, you know, during the winter and, and vice versa. So you'd want to speed it up. And, uh, and you know, the double folio system was a kind of an incredible, you know, workaround on, uh, on how to do that. And it's quite, you know, interesting how they uh, would keep adjusting it and keep engaging and disengaging those levers to, uh, to get the clocks run faster or slower to somehow maintain some correlation to what the sundial said. So I hope that, <laughs> hope that uh, answered as much as uh, is possible. Mm-hmm.